I know you're going to dig this. Ryan McLenn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Centers award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Zooming in all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada, is Mr. Billy Nunn, songwriter. <laughs> keyboardist and producer with the punk funk group Rick James and the Stone City Band. Welcome and thank you for agreeing to come on our show. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. And that, thank you. I really appreciate it. You well, know, you this know, is quite an do, honor. <laughs> well, we're going to do, we're going to get started. And the first thing I want to start off with is how did you get interested in music and work your way up to being with Rick James? Oh, getting into music. I mean, my dad was a sax player and, and, and tremendous vocalist. So, you know, we always heard uh, music around the house. And uh, a neighbor, a friend of my mom's, uh, gave her an album. Walk on the Wild Side was on the album. It was Bashing by Jimmy Smith. Yeah, Edith I, Ingram and my mom, Jimmy they were Smith. in the uh, yes, Columbia a, Record Club. You remember that? Oh, yes. So you, yeah. You pay like, what, 99 cents and you get 120 albums? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, I heard Jimmy Smith. And uh, I don't know, I got bit by the organ bug. So uh, I just... Really, how something, you know, you? turned me out you? on it. Yeah. Well, Billy, how old were you when you started? When you started really knowing uh, that you wanted to get into music? I was, <laughs> I was actually about 16, 17 years old. I was in high school, and there was a guy, Jimmy Davis, who was a year ahead of me at our high school. And uh, when he graduated during the summer, I'd go over his house, and he'd show me, you know, a couple of things that, uh, you know, I was wondering about. And uh, so he helped me a great deal. Yeah. So and from you, then, a lot of albums, listening and sitting at a little piano and just trying to pick stuff out. So how, how, did, how did you know that the organ was what you wanted to play? Uh, like I said, uh, you know, I look back now and I still don't know. But it was something about that album bash and, and uh, on Verve Records by Jimmy Smith that, I don't know, like I said, I always call it the organ bug bit me, but uh, yeah, thank God. <laughs> well, well, now, how did you learn to play the organ? Uh, like I said, between the little uh, tips and, and, and stuff that Jimmy Davis would show me, basically I just listen to uh, all the albums, all the organ players that were out there. So Jimmy Smith, talk. Jimmy McGriff, Jack McDuff, you know. And I sit at the piano and try to pick notes out, you know. So basically, you were self-taught. Oh, yeah, right, okay. yeah. As, as they would say, you played by ear. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and you know, Jimmy Smith, <laughs> And uh, what, what uh, I, I can recall, Jimmy Smith, um, there was uh, somebody, McDuff. Jack uh, McDuff. Yeah, that played. So, you know, and, and they played that B3 organ. 
Oh yeah, that that was the instrument. Yeah. We call it we call it the beast because it's so big and weighs so much. But uh, I mean, it, like you said, it was Jimmy Jack McDub, Jimmy McGriff, Don Patterson, Larry Young, Big John Patton, uh, Groove Holmes. Uh, it was it was the thing to be playing back then. You and, you, and and you know, like at a at a supper club or wherever they were, you they would have this. It would take so much to get that instrument in to the building. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, after dollies came out, where you could sit it on these dollies that had had uh, the wheels that would lift up. Up until then, it was like at least four to five guys, you know. Uh, moving that thing. It weighed uh, about 450, 475 pounds. You know, and that's without the Leslie speaker or the bench or the foot pedals. <laughs> Do you so, still have one? It, it was a task. <laughs> Do you still have one? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I still do. Yeah, I have one. Uh, over a friend of mine has a studio, Rob Simon. I have, I have my. Uh, it's actually a BC. It's so old. It was made in 1939. You know, oh. and <laughs> it's kind of like a a relic. But uh, those things, they don't never wear out. You know, they they play just as good the first day you bought them. So, so when you were in, so your career started like when you were probably in high school, if you're 16 or 17. So you started really, what was your first band experience or your first public playing? Uh, um, <laughs> what's funny, in high school, the first band experience, I was singing, actually. I was with a... Uh, we had a group called the Four Andantes, and we'd go from high school to high school singing a cappella before a high school jazz band played. So it was like me, Levi Ruffin, Roger Brown, Calvin Moore. We'd do like, you know, the time. I don't know if you remember that group. Oh, uh, yeah. As we stroll along, yeah, you know, anyway, we, we, we do stuff like that a cappella. But then, during that course of months, that's when uh, I got the organ bug. So by the time of our senior year, I wasn't thinking much about singing. I was uh, <laughs> actually, you know, wanting to get into the playing a lot more. I had met Jack McDuff and... He kind of like took a liking to me because I was like 17 years old and he used to let me sit on the bench with him and I'd sit there and learn and watch and George Benson was playing with him at that time and Red Holloway and Joe Duke. So that was like a real learning experience, you know, sitting at the McDuff and actually watching what was taking place between the two hands and your foot pedals, yeah. It says a blessing. So, so as as so after that, and so what was your first real gig? Uh, actually, it was with a vibe player out of uh, Springfield, Ohio, named Johnny Lytell. And uh, at the time, he had had a couple of like. Uh, jazz caller. hits. He had, uh, his first caller. hit was like That's a song, song called The Village Caller. Yes. But he, yeah, so he was the vibe player. He needed an organ player. Uh, the drummer, Joselle Carter, hit me up for the gig. And uh, I was like on the road with him about three years. So I kind of like really grew up uh, mentally, physically, and musically. I mean, you know, when you start out and you're like 17, 18 and, and on the road and you, you got to deal with the heavies, you know. So uh, I learned how to play, actually, like what I call it. It's like playing jazz is totally different than, you know, uh, funk or, you know, R&B or whatever. When you play jazz, you got to learn it 
and you got to play it. You know, ain't no jiving around and bullying with it. You know, you got to learn chord changes, how to solo off of them, and, you know, so that's what I learned actually being with Johnny Lytell. And uh, after that, I mean, you know, when I got into funk, funk's a feeling. If you don't get the feeling, yeah, it ain't happening. But, I mean, um, musically-wise, you know, it wasn't dangerous or uh, scary. <laughs> okay, Tim, so when did you transfer from jazz to the funk? Well, uh, just so happened my dad, like I said, he had a club in Buffalo called Jan Supper Club, right on Main Street. And he brought in different groups. He brought in the Soft Tones. They had a record out at that time, My Dream. He had Blue Magic. They had Spell, that was out, he had the Dynamic Superiors before Shoe Shoe Shine. And they'd come to my dad's club and none of them had a keyboard player. So I'd sit in with all of them when they'd come, you know, to the club. Cause I mean, even though I was into jazz on the weekends, I was listening to basically, you know, R&B and, and uh, all kind of stuff. And, uh, I always opened up my ears. I mean, you know, I was listening to Chicago back when they first came out, you know, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, you know. so many different groups, you know. So, I, I mean, I used to love the Beatles. Yeah, I'd sit there and listen to them and have two little drumsticks trying to play along, you know. It was like a blessing to me to, to open up my ears and accept all kinds of music so that's what it was the so, funk yeah, like i said it's a feeling and uh if you got it in you you know it works usually all the time you know between you and the drummer and a bass player that's when it uh really starts kicking in <laughs> let's talk about your dad um you, you you already mentioned that your dad had a supper club, but 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 your dad is, is um, for Buffalo, New York. I mean, your dad's a very historic person on what he contributed to the music business. Talk, let's talk about what your dad did besides having the club. What else did your dad do? Well, I said yeah, he was the first um, black to have his own recording label and studio, which was uh, in our basement, you know. So you got to listen to, uh, you know, all the Motown stuff, and I think at that time Brunswick Records was out and, and, and the stuff out of Chicago. Uh, so he decided he wanted to start a record label and he wanted to make Modo. So that's how uh, Modo Records came about. You know, with him wanting to make Modo, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was great. I mean, my brother Bobby, uh, him and the guy across the street they had a group, Bob and Gene, and they put out some uh, local hits back then. And uh, I think my Bobby, my brother Bobby, really uh, tuned his craft up with with, with writing you know, being in the basement. I mean, we recorded a lot of people when I'd come home or be playing in Buffalo, you know, in the basement, we were doing gospel groups. We were doing, um, you know, people doing R&B, male, female, all of it, you know. So how long did uh, the studio last? How uh, the record label last? Wow, uh, exactly. I'm not sure. It, it, it probably at least a good ten years or more. I mean, till he got to the point where you know he was just kind of tired of you know doing all the recordings. But uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, we did in the basement is being used today. One of the songs from Bob and Gene is in uh, the Tyler Perry movie. Uh, Why did I marry two? 
And then when I was in the uh, Forrest Mid- Whitaker movie, I think uh, something about a honeymoon. But uh, it was funny, the stuff we did back in the 60s is now being, uh, you know, licensed and, and placed in different spots. Uh, he did have a, a vision, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah, and um, he had a vision, and he goes, and he has a historic notation. And, oh, yeah. and, that, and that's yeah. extremely important because um, that, I, because I, uh, what I read about him was that he was uh, started out not only about the, the Mo Do, but the fact that it was an, another way to take kids off the streets from getting oh, yeah. into gangs and being yeah. allowed to do musical expressions. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah a lot of people used to be in that basement. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I remember, we, I remember we covered the whole basement with, like, milk cartons one time, you know, to help absorb the sound. We stapled uh, milk cartons all around the studio, you know. But he, he'd... Uh, He'd read up on things, and we'd try it, and I said, uh, he carried his, uh, back then he had like a, a real to real machine, you know, a two-track, and he'd carry that around, and we'd be playing in Rochester, and he'd, he'd bring it up there and record and stuff. Uh, my dad was a blessing. <laughs> Your dad was an entrepreneur by having a, a supper club and and having his own uh, recording studio. And then not only that, he had talented sons. So, oh yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 I mean that's that was a total uh, package of, of blessings right there. And he had a day gig, you know. Oh. <laughs> he worked at a place called Trico in Buffalo, and Trico made windshield wipers. And I mean, he he started off in there, uh, probably you know helping on the assembly line or whatever. But he then became um, the first black uh, union leader of Trico in Buffalo. You know, so he never stopped. <laughs> you couldn't get him to slow down. But you know, well, so you come from a very. Um work ethic background yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my mom she you know everybody knows my mom from being a school crossing guard back when uh, we were all in grammar school and <laughs> the school was like a half a block from where we lived so my mom would be at the corner uh, for school 37 and I mean, there's people now, I get all kind of Facebook messages who are blessed to still be alive. Her birthday was yesterday, in fact, September 2nd. And I got so many messages, you know, from people that remember her being a school crossing guard there, yeah, man. It is <laughs> amazing. So, so tell me some of the exciting things that you, you have done uh, or leading up to let, let's talk about what how, how you how did you get to Rick James? You haven't told me that story yet. I need to hear that. How did I get to where now? <laughs> With Rick James and the story. Oh, Bang. How did oh you get okay. To that? Who was that? No, no, just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, I had been with a group of soft tones out of Baltimore for uh, about three years. I've been living in Baltimore. We were touring. We've been to Japan three times. And uh, one of the times we were there, we opened for the Miracles, uh, Billy Griffin and them. They had a Love Machine album out then. And uh, so Soft Tones, we'd open for them. But then at that time, they didn't have a keyboard player. So, you know, I'd sit in with them on, you know, some of the stuff. I knew, and then talk came about of, uh, you know, maybe me getting a gig with him. And it didn't go through, so the April of uh, 77, I went back to Buffalo. And uh, my brother and Vanessa Brooks introduced me to Rick 
she had introduced uh, my brother Bobby to Rick, and then he had just got back from uh, Toronto. He had been living up there. He was a draft dodger, and then uh, when um, President Carter granted amnesty, he was able to come back down to Buffalo. So I met him that way, uh, like April of 77, and uh, we just, just clicked, got along. You know, uh, he had an apartment, 210 Delaware, and we'd go up there and be instruments up in there, and we'd, you know, just sit around and try to create some stuff. You know, maybe hit a joint or two and, uh, you know, just have fun. We did it uh, every day and every night. At night, we go hang out at the B Room, the Vermilion Room in Buffalo, and, you know, just listening to the new stuff and, you know, trying to get ideas to help the songs that he wanted us to help him with, you know, record. So and, you helped uh, him right It was cool. To- because uh, like we were all Jane. equal then. <laughs> you, you helped him and, um, write Mary Jane, correct? <laughs> you helped him write Mary Jane? Uh, yeah. Yep. I did the music. Rick did the lyrics. Yeah. It was... Uh, Tell me about how that... First of all, let me... Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no. How did that... How did that... Ex- how did that uh, come about? That that you are actually you that you played the music. He wrote the songs, and he, you you. Well, what, what happened with Rick was uh, he had some songs, and he needed some musicians, you know, that could play to uh, record the stuff with him. So that's uh, that's what I did a lot of, you know, by hanging with him, getting kind of whatever little basic structure of songs that he had. So, I mean, when we did You and I, see, first of all, there are two Stone City bands on the Come Get It album. If, if uh, Stone City band was basically a, a concept Rick had for his group, but the musicians that played on side one of Come Get It, that's You and I, uh, Sexy Baby, there's whatever songs are on the, first side consisted of Lorenzo Shaw on drums, his brother Richard Shaw on bass, my brother Bobby on keys, myself on keys, and Fast Freddy Rapello on guitar. That was basically the rhythm section for Stone City Band, as he called it. The Brecker Brothers came down from New York and put the horns on uh, the first side of the album. Uh, they're on You and I and and the other songs that are on there with horns. Uh, High on Your Love Sweet, which made it on the uh, Bustin' Out album, the second album. So after uh, basically money conflicts with Rick, uh, my brother and, and, and Sasha Rose, she was the vocalist, and Richard and Lorenzo Shaw didn't want to complete some more songs with them that Motown wanted him to do. So I stuck around, and he came and showed me one day uh, a B on the bass and an A. So he said, hey, man, I need you to help me finish this. We write it together. We split it. So... I said, cool, no problem. So I put chords to them two notes, which is a V minor to an A seventh or whatever, and then did verses, did the bridge. And for years, I never told anybody, Low Down by Bob Skaggs was like my inspiration for Mary Jane. Because if you sing the verses on Low Down and slow them down, uh, you can sing Mary Jane to them. After that, you know, I, I wrote a totally different bridge, a totally different flute parts with his string parts are different, but, you know. So that was basically it, you know, the, the backgrounds. And uh, we recorded it at Record Plant in, in New York. 
and I'm the only black guy in the rhythm section, even though I co-wrote it. <laughs> you know, so Freddie Rapello, who was a guitar player, his brother Andy was the bass player, and Mike Caputi was on drums. So that's the basic rhythm section on uh, side two of Come Get It, which is Be My Lady, Mary Jane, and Hollywood. So, uh, totally different group. Yeah. But Mary Jane was a very popular song. Yeah, it's and, uh, like it, about 42 years old. Yeah, we wrote it in 77. Uh, recorded it at the end of 77, and it came out uh, on the album, which was 420 of uh, 78. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I got beat out of co-writing the song on, on the paperwork, but uh, Rick was supposed to kick me down under the table. We were boys, and, you know, I guess probably uh, what I call a hoopla must have got in him because, uh, you know, he never really wanted to acknowledge me co-writing it, you know. And uh, so I'm in, like, trying to get an entertainment lawyer now. I'm trying to battle to get, you know, not necessarily 42 years of royalties, but uh, get my name on the copyright. I mean, it's still making money. And uh, I feel good. I mean, it's an achievement that a lot of people don't get a chance to do, you know, write a, a hit song. You know, so I'm in that process. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yes, and, and, and you know, it's one of those things that uh, when you're young and you're in business, when you don't know the business and you enjoy doing what you're doing, uh, sometimes folks do take advantage of you, and and, and uh, so, uh, but everything I believe works out for the best. And it, it uh, Billy, you you, uh, you you still got it going on, so it, it hasn't hurt you. Oh maybe, yeah, maybe I have no com no complaints. You know, I said God gave me this gift to play, and uh, I'm still at it. You know. It's, it's uh, unfortunate Rick is gone. He's been gone, what, 15, 16 years. And uh, I still get a chance to, uh, you know, try to help people, try to enlighten people, you know, lift the spirits, you know, with my music. You know, I'm working on a TV show of mine, None at One, and uh, trying to do a book. A video book actually called um, <laughs> Don't Start Me to Lion, which was my mom's favorite saying back in the old days. Somebody be gossiping and asking, and she say, Look, don't start me to lion. So that's uh, kind of like what my video book is about, which will unveil some, you know, musical secrets and, and you know, stuff like that you um you you got inducted into the buffalo music hall of fame tell me about that experience oh that was it was uh i got a call from from one of the guys back there i think it was richard Sargent or something and he said that uh you're being nominated for uh uh, 2015 Buffalo Hall of Fame Awards, and I was like, oh, wow, okay, cool. I did a lot of paperwork because it, in actuality, a lot of people back there didn't know who I was and stuff, so I had to, uh, you know, just come up with some documents, a couple of, couple of album cover pictures or whatever, you know, but uh, I flew back in the same same day they were uh, putting uh processing the do rags uh in the hall of fame back in buffalo but i mean it was it was a great unbelievable uh unexpected experience and 
I just wish my mom and dad had been been alive to see it, but uh, I know they were looking down. But I mean, it's yeah. Who would have thought? <laughs> but I, I, you know, I just wanted to highlight that because that is such an accomplishment, especially to be recognized in your own community. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said it's you know it's a blessing to still be alive and playing. <laughs> so so, so know, tell me yeah. tell me now, Billy. Billy, what are you doing now? Well, like I said, right now I'm um, I'm uh, trying to work on uh, on this TV show, None at One, and uh, it's like a musical comedy tutorial informative uh, interviews uh, live stream jams you know it's it's like big ball of entertainment you know i, I have like different co-hosts i have mr levi ruffin who was a uh, other keyboard player with rick and uh We'll probably he'll probably do like a Chappelle, Charlie Murphy thing because Levi was there through all the drama of uh, Rick, Tina, Mary Jane girls, uh, process of the do rags, Val Young. I mean, all the all the things that were happening in in, in the um, Stone City Band camp and everything. A lot of funny stuff, a lot of tragic, but um, he'll be telling tales with me and we'll be doing some jams together and we'll do tutorials showing um people what we really played on rick's uh, stuff and uh i've seen a lot of people play it and not not exactly correct they have it wrong but uh that's no problem so we'll be doing stuff like that and i'll be doing like oregon b3 tutorials also Showing licks that uh, Jimmy did and McDuff and you know everybody's doing piano on on YouTube. You know, he said how to play such and such. You punch it in. Some great players showing you the right chords and everything, but nobody's doing any organ, not the real way. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do that. And then, like I said, the book, video book. Just trying to keep busy, especially with this uh, craziness around us. <laughs> with the COVID. And yeah. Are, do, do you, are you still playing? Uh, are you still doing any gigs or anything like that? Well, you know, since the uh, pandemic, you know, I haven't been in any gigs. I mean, I've been over uh, a few close friends either doing recordings or, you know, we'll sit up in there and do a little bit of jamming between maybe three or four of us. But uh, I think it's going to be a while before they get uh, entertainment back uh, in the casinos. You know, they're trying to get that money back in there that they lost with uh, the gambling. So, I think, you know, until they figure out a way how to be kind of safe to have people in lounges again or, or in the showrooms again yeah sometime next year for sure if then <laughs> well i'm going to ask you to name me three highlights of your career so far and three learning experiences that you've had from your career thus far uh, i mean uh, i said i've had I look back and I've had something like the, you know, greatest experiences that, that uh, I can't sum it up. I mean, it's just like insane. That's why I, on my website, billynun.com, I've got so many pictures, yeah. luckily, and, and, you know, back then everybody didn't have cameras and, you know, and uh, especially videos, but... I got, I've been blessed, you know, with a lot of footage from uh, different situations and and a ton of pictures. What but, about? Uh, what I'm about still, you know, I'm what, still at it and and still uh, what about probably the best is yet to come, really. <laughs> what about some of your experiences while traveling in Europe or Japan? Uh, 
I mean, that should be unique experiences that uh, when you're oh, in Japan yeah. and in Europe. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think with the soft tones, I went over there, uh, Japan with them at least three times. It may, right, may have been four. Three times with them. Then I was uh, with the uh, Buck Ram Platters, which uh, was an experience. We went to Osaka. Well, you know, which I'd done with the Soft Tones also, but being a member of the Buck Ram Platters, Buck Ram was the gentleman that wrote all the hits for the Platters. Only You, Great Pretender. And so if you're a member of the Buck Ram Platters, that was kind of like a, a cosign on the legit side because, you know, singers will be in a group and they'll leave and they'll start their own group. <laughs> you know, so uh, there have been a few platters around, a few coasters, a few drifters, but depending on... Uh, which ones you were with depended on your status of uh, basically like uh, getting uh, the props on it. But the Buck Ram platters were uh, like supposed to be the legit platters because of Buck Ram and Gene Bennett, his wife. Yeah. So I mean, I did that and uh, the jazz experience probably was uh, the most enlightening because finally I'm out there doing what I've been listening to on records for so long, you know. I'm saying, wow, now I'm doing it, you know, and it's uh, still happening. I'm going to do some organ things because, like I said, you know, you're hearing everybody on piano. And I never was a piano player, organ and piano two different instruments. They're keyboards, per se, but uh, the style of playing them is, is, is two different animals. Well, what is the biggest lesson you have learned thus far uh, as a musician, entertainer, writer, overall uh, musician? <laughs> Learn how to play. Okay, uh, cutting and paste, and anybody can do that. That doesn't make you a musician or a songwriter, actually. You know, learn how to play an instrument. You know, learn as much as you can about. You know, you don't have to get too deep in into the the uh, theory of music and all of that. I mean, it, you know, it gets to a point where it's mathematical and and uh, there's certain formulas, but, you know, once you learn how to play an instrument and it gives you a broader side of uh, real music, you know, and then learn the music business. Don't trust nobody and get it in paper, you know. I, I would like to ask you two things. One is, why do you think that the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center is important. And number two is what is funk to you? Well, uh, David called me uh, some years back. In fact, uh, <laughs> you probably have to ask him and I'll have to ask him. He, he kind of like gave me a little title up in there. like. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, something like a, an ambassador to help <laughs> with the funk music situation. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's a great idea that he, he put together. And, and the city of Dayton deserves it. I mean, I talk to all my musician friends. No other city in the world put out as many funk great groups as Dayton, Ohio. They, they rule. You know, no other city in the world, and it will never happen again, you know. So it's like, a, you know, to be a part of anything to me is, is an honor, you know, because uh, who would have thought? I mean, this it's not promised to none of us. So when things happen to you that uh, 
people show that they like and and love what you're doing i mean that's it's an unbelievable feeling you know sometimes it's like you know when you're playing and you're in the zone as we call it you know that same feeling and then when you get all the applause and 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 everything we you know touch some people's lives can't beat it you know Thank you so much. You, that was just so inspiring. Um, oh, we finished? <laughs> you have uh, something I, else you want to tell me, Billy? I'm just playing now. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe, yeah. You know, one day I'll probably do a part two or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, but I really appreciate it, though. <laughs> well, well, I've really enjoyed the uh, interview, the fact that we have been able to talk about your dad and and his vision and and his historic uh, nota notability in uh, Buffalo, New York. You you yeah. receiving uh, being inducted into the Buffalo Hall of Fame. Those are all extremely important, and, and it's important that if we don't tell our story, nobody's going to tell it. And we have an opportunity to right. share with so many people about what a Billy Nunn has done and is doing. I thank you. This I is thank Ryan you. And, Glenn. and uh, mm -hmm. hey, any lawyers out there, hit me up. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. Thank you.